Hello, it's Liam Henderson and Johanna Randall. And we are in Madrid this week. Why are we here, Johanna? Um, we're at the Smart Metro conference. And what is smart about Metro? Naive. <laughs> <laughs> You, you didn't say you were going to ask me a smart question. <laughs> <laughs> quick, quick, read up what it says. <laughs> what is smart metro? What do they tell us? <laughs> um, <jo. laughs> now I feel like an idiot. No, a smart. A smart idiot. <laughs> right. Uh, it's done by Smart Rail World, who we spoke at their conference in Munich as well, when we spoke about mobility as a service. Which is also the reason we're here this week, is that we did a double presentation um, yesterday talking about uh, mobility as a service um, in the urban environment. And we were in a part of a, presentation, part of a uh, session that also had people from um, private operators working to help mobility as a service. And also, I think it was Budapest Metro. Budapest, Transdev and um, Renfe. Yes. So that was who we were sharing our platform with. Renfe is the Spanish national yes. rail operator. So uh, we were talking obviously about mobility service and we have already done a, present, a uh, podcast about that. But the particular topic we're on is about data in mobility as a service. And Johanna, you put up a slide um, and talked through it as to why data is so important. Could you talk about that a second? since we did the presentation in Munich we've been doing a lot more research into what does mobility as a service mean um, who's doing it well who yeah who's doing it not so well what are the barriers so and we're looking at publishing a report before the end of the, the year that will back up our research and our thoughts and that's into it but what we what we found is that um, in order for mobility as a service to work, whether this be at a local level, a national level, or even internationally, is that operators, and in particular the um, mass providers or the integrators, shall we say, need to have access to the data. And by data, this is this is fair data. This is um, journey planning data, this is train running, bus running data, um, whatever you can think about. And this is data that is probably, in some ways, not even really collected yet, nobody, because nobody yeah. knows what to do with this and how it can be used best with the customer. Because what we're finding with other as-a-service systems, so when you think of you know, the way we download our music now, the way we access um, books, you know, through our favourite shopping channels or whatever, or just anything. Everything is moving to more of an as-a-service model, so that we are only buying what we want when we want it, and it's personalised and recommended to us. Subscription-based as well, sub isn't it? And subscription-based. Yep. And to be able to grow this, you need the data. And when we were talking yesterday after our presentation with um, Transdev is that we're probably at a pinnacle in terms of transport development at the moment that is equal to going from the horse and cart to the car or to motorised transport. So we're getting rid of the poop. We're getting rid of the poop, yes. I mean, which I, which I think is, which I think is interesting in itself because um, one of the reasons why the car all of a sudden took off, particularly in cities, because we are talking a lot about cities yeah. and the way you do connected journeys across cities, particularly you know as we move you know from one transport mode to another, is that um, I think um, I read that. Um, if um, if New York had continued using horses with the way the way it had, it would have had a huge poop problem, and right. it would now be about sixty feet higher than it currently is because it would have just been Ew. buried under it only for its horse poop. Yeah, <laughs> just imagine that. Imagine that smell. But I think you know it's important that we are at this um, at this point because we talk about personalisation. Yeah. And the ultimate personal transport is the car. But with climate, it's unsustainable. So we've kind of got an unsustainable business model if we really are 
um, ta going to tackle climate and reducing um, and becoming carbon neutral and carbon zero, whatever you want to call it. But also, I think with the way we can use technology and the Internet of Things and the way we run, the transport providers are really going to find themselves in trouble if they don't start sharing the data. Yes. Because there are a lot of challenges already out there who are undercutting what they can do. Yes, there's, a, there's another... I think we'll, we'll go in a second to hearing some snippets from what we said, but there's a, there was a slide that we showed which had thousands of small companies or big companies across Europe in the mobility space all developing different data streams and data sources to help pull together the, the mass idea but all of those people are developing things because the current transport mobility market isn't isn't filling that space so other people are filling this space but that's effectively pri it's almost privatizing everything because the public providers in future will have to go to these private companies to buy their data. It's privatising it, but it's not also necessarily coming up with the best outcome for the consumer. Oh, no. Because, of course, as a result of that privatisation and the lack of integration, um, one of the things that I highlighted is the fact that every time you go to a different city, or even, you know, even within the same country, what you're ending up with is app overload. Yeah. And I think that was another key point that um, Transdev highlighted is is that Mass is not an app. Correct. It can't be. It's integration of all the transport modes that allows you to seamlessly travel across them. Yes. And actually, uh, one of the interesting things that came up in that Transdev presentation was the idea of a personal mobility account, so that you effectively have a profile somewhere in the ether that every time you go across an operator they just have act they you lend them access to your yeah. personal mobility account therefore you don't need to worry about fares and having a billing account with each operator they just have access to your mobility and of course profile. he produced a, um, an excellent statistic on that personal mobility account because I think was it sort of like 95% of people they're just doing journeys within their local yeah. local area you know their commute going to school you know, you know doing their leisure activities or whatever, whatever it is they need and actually so we were the oddballs because only 5% of the world 5 to 7% of the world I think it was that um, are actually regularly doing other stuff you know whether it's going to conferences flying internationally for business it's a really small number yes so it's you know how do you create that um, local personal account but also allow people to flex yeah. their, their needs when they need to you know you know the people that are say only going you know because I guess people a lot of people within the western world shall we say go on holiday for two weeks every year yeah. you know, or do other stuff so how do you talk you know it's, I'm trying to think the um, what how you define it in terms of your use cases for, for taking this forward. It's the you know it's the edge cases. Yeah. You know the, what what isn't done what isn't particularly but allows the system to flex. And also and, those are the times when you're most reliant on yeah. apps <laughs> for information and guidance. So it's the perfect I'm guessing, time I'm guessing to get that people. information yeah. because because uh, I was I was thinking because. In terms of that personal mobility account, um, one of the things that we raised was, um, do we need an international clearing system for travel? This is very similar to the banking system, but um, that in itself has a barrier because that was raised because what can because so much public money is involved yeah. in. Um, in transport provision as opposed to private money, would countries allow payments to go across to Ireland and then to Luxembourg and then to Spain or and even come outside back the EU? Or outside, back into yeah, because yeah, EU is probably quite easy to do. Yeah, but if you've you got were currency sending, risk yeah. as well. And I think there's probably a lot we could probably learn from maybe fintech or something yeah. that would allow us to maybe go forward on that and develop it. Yes. Also, the data being used, uh, how the data flows are going, also that data will need to go around the world. And at the moment, some countries don't let their data leave the EU or home country. 
some of the CRM systems that do accounting already, send it around the world. But essentially we are talking about a banking system in terms of moving this forward. So what is there to learn from the banking system that would allow different regulations to be able to cope with doing that, those sorts of transactions? Yes. Which is also an interesting point because now we're in the world of open banking. So all the banks have had to make information freely available to uh, startups who are interested in telling you how much you spend at the cinema. Um, and that, that has had to, that's forced the banking industry to agree protocols and data exchanges and APIs. And in transport, we need to do exactly the same. So the model is already there, <laughs> yeah. and what we actually need to say is... Put that in the report. <laughs> put that in the report. I will do. I'll look, I'll look at banking. But it is, I think it is an interesting concept. Think, that a model is there that we could tweak yeah. to developing a personal mobility account and allow transport providers throughout the world to be able to integrate into it. Yes, and then that... But that is bringing in a new, a new interface between consumers and the transport operators, which is pushing the transport operators one step further from the consumer, effectively, because we've now brought in another, mm. another, well, not industry, I, but another. But you field. See, I, I wonder whether actually it is. I mean, I talked about a new customer relationship. And it's not about moving who's responsible for the customer away, but you want to you want to areas of um, you want businesses to concentrate on what they're good at. Yeah. So actually, do you want to move to a system where transport are actually concentrating on the comfort and getting people to their destination on time? And then you want integrators that are actually responsible for the retailing of the product and ensuring that operators are getting the correct revenue stream for their service. Yes, but that's a trust leap for the operator. Oh, my favourite topic, trust leaps. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's because they're going to lose control. So someone's going to have to force them to accept that world. And I think that's interesting. I think for people, um, I'm, I know we've spoken about trust leaps before when we did our podcast on autonomous vehicles and, and um, the, um, the Oxford professor, um, Rachel Botsman, um, who writes about trust leaps. But I think essentially that is what we're talking, you know, we're talking about here is, you know, trust between operators, trust with customers. Yeah. And... We need to move, you know, we need to sort of like, you know, fill in what are those gaps, what are those uncertainties, and how do we answer those fears in order to make those leaps into this new model? You also presented some um, current suppliers of a mass uh, concept, but each one of them was hamstrung and restricted because it didn't cover all modes of transport. And in most cases, well, in some cases, because it didn't cover rail. (laughs) And the rail one, this particular rail one, didn't cover uh, mobility, (laughs) whether it was scooters or anything. And I think that's the thing is, I mean, like, in terms of that current ecosystem of all the people developing it and, you know, some of the challenges such as WIM, who are probably in some ways the most advanced in lots of ways because they have, I mean, key to this is that they have backing of the government... Yeah. And I think that's the thing. I mean, like we talk about data and opening it up because so many of these organisations are publicly funded. Government policy is key to this in terms of what you do with any regulations and policies that govern your public transport. But then it's also how to integrate the innovation from the private sector yeah. into that as well. And that's where, you know, where the integrators come in. Yeah. So I think we can actually, at the moment, just have a listen to uh, what we said in the conference, and we'll go to that now. Um, so that just goes to show that just we, we find ways to experience and technology and our, our use of data and our access to information is allowing us to do that. 
So, you know, we demand increasingly personalization within, within our journeys. You know, we want, you know, more experience that are, you know, um, relevant to me. My favorite music app of choice, Apple or something like BBC Sounds, Liam. You know, we're no longer buying CDs or albums. We're, you know, we're, we're tailoring our music preferences in, in the same way that these brands are making, you know, they're building a relationship with us as well because they're making recommendations according to what they think we'll want. The same as with mobility in the fact that it's providing us with more opportunities to travel. We're constantly on the go. We want to move seamlessly between different, between different systems. It's not just about one journey anymore. It's about the connecting. There are a number of definitions of mobility as a service. I think most of you know the concept, but effectively, I decide I need to get to a destination, a mobility provider guides me there. Um, I have a profile with this company and they say, right, you like taking the train, you like sitting in a seat by the window, you like having a full tummy, so go get this train to this destination, change, go onto this train and you'll be at the destination. The next phase of that is obviously that you get your ticket from the mass provider, your, whether it's a boarding pass, barcode or something else. But basically, all of your journey preferences come through one provider in one interface. That's where most definitions stop. Our definition, in, for the purpose of this uh, presentation, there's a next stage which is guaranteeing those journeys. So it's all very well to say, right, go and get that train and go to Madrid. But if something goes wrong along the way, who is taking responsibility for me? And in an airline system, if your flight is disrupted or something along the route, you're in the system and you're taken care of. In the current mobility system, if you're disrupted anywhere along the way, that's it, you've got to sort yourself out. You might be at a bus stop. I was on my own. <laughs> um, so that's, the, that's, the, set, that's the, the ideal world, is that you're protected through this whole process. And actually, the stage beyond that is, why do I have to tell a mass provider where I need to get to? They should see in my calendar where I'm going. And that sort of moves into lifestyle as a service. Basically, service. And that's essentially what we're talking about. But what that's, does it look like now? <laughs> I couldn't think of a better word for this than a gold rush of companies rushing in to do things in the mobility space. So I did get the slide online. Um, but effectively, these are all the companies trying to get into different parts of the mobility landscape. Now, it's quite intimidating the amount of people trying to do things. And it's definitely ripe for some sort of consolidation. But as a consumer, I can't possibly deal with all of these companies. So I need something on the front. Sorry, can go around a second. I basically need an interface that is my personal interface to this world. It's worth us pointing particularly at data, because unless you sort data, none of the other stuff can really take it to the next level until you sort out those data flows and permissions, uh, protocols, Profits, because at the moment we have the issue of who owns the passenger, who owns the data, and to a passenger, the end user, that's irrelevant. There is a big lack of trust in terms of the fare system. Yeah. Um, operators have trust in terms of giving up power and data. Yeah. So collecting data it. and collecting it. I'm like TFL have probably been one of the most innovative in this area. So I just wanted to raise some uh, other products that we have experience of. So on the, first of all, on the right hand side, this is the very common website, Trainline. Even on Trainline, you can't integrate, the data doesn't exist for you to book a seat. So you just get allocated. Or well, in this case, not even allocated to the seat, despite the fact that you click you want a seat. The systems in the rail system aren't working. On the left hand side, you have an app. It's a watch app called Watch My Train. And it shows you services on upcoming trains. But interestingly, all of those data aren't from the National Rail Network because they've had to develop their own data feeds to show consumers this information. And the point that comes back to this presentation is that people are already using these services, these uh, third-party services. They're not going to go to the train company's website and give their data over there. They're doing it in the medium that's comfortable for them. So the talk about data and whether to make it available is sort of it's to the detriment of existing operators because they're never going to get these passengers. So they may as well make the data available 
and work out a deal to get some profit from it, because otherwise you're not going to get the passengers at all. Okay, so in a bit of a segue, because we forgot to mention at the start that we are at this conference, Smart Metro, uh, but uh, in a three-part podcast, there's actually a bonus presentation from Johanna, who will be speaking just after this podcast about... Gateless gate lines. Gateless gate lines. <laughs> does, that, does that have some sort of segue from mass? Um, come I, on, come on, bring it together somehow. I think it does, because whilst we say that mass is not a, an app, Mass is a personal account which we expect to be held in a cloud or a digital world of some sorts. And if you if you are going from a system where you're physically going through a barrier to one which is based on um, cloud technology, Internet of Things, beacons, whatever it may be, yeah, or you know, or biometrics, you know, whatever, and you have an account, the system will know where you are and it will allow you to pass through seamlessly between different transport systems and charge your account. Right. So that is also probably a vital part of Mass in the sense that it knows what journeys you are making and nudging you and showing you the way all the time without actually you having to think about it. So if your if your behaviour changes or your diary changes or something disruption happens along the way, the whole thing is linked in to make it easier for you to readjust and for the journey to be personalised to the changes in your life. Right. So that would then rely on some sort of uh, individual beacon or presence or tracking or... What is the thing that no, the system There's, knows what you're doing? Well, I guess really, I mean, like, there are all sorts of ways that you can do this and all sorts of ways that I don't even know exist yet. So, you know, so I've seen examples of um, where you can use um, LIDAR. I've seen examples where you can use biometrics. Um, they, they use biometrics in um, Dubai, in the airport. Um, they've, I've seen biometrics in China for crowd control. They are um, testing at Heathrow Airport, being able to leave the country without showing your passport or your ticket. And I just so, saw that there was a contract signed, a treaty signed between, I think it's the Netherlands and Canada. So you won't need a passport to go between those two so, countries. So these things are already being used in other areas. Um, I've also, um, I was thinking, um, I've also seen ways where through um, cloud-based computing using blockchain. Yeah. You know, so there are lots of technologies available to be able to run it. I think part of, you know, it comes back to the data, is I think in terms of moving some of these things forward, what will be quite important is the rollout of 5G technology because some of this will take huge data processing right. in terms of you know how many millions of people you know if you just take the city of London as one example how many people move around the city of London every day you know millions millions <laughs> yeah. yeah that's the thing and it's it's the ability of a system to be able to track bigger data because probably at its simplest oyster and contactless on that tfl system for example yeah it's probably quite simple because you're checking in and checking out a system whereas this is going to require to be smarter because it's going to be tracking people's personal accounts it's going to be tracking that it is them for security purposes yeah so it is going to be so much more complicated right okay brave new world in that respect yes definitely brave new world and that brings us on to phase three of the podcast is our journey home. Now, why are we taking the train home? Um, why are you taking the train home? I know why I'm taking the train home. Because I'm desperately trying to reduce the amount I fly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was an absolute pain to book the train back to the UK from it was. Madrid. So how did you book your train? Uh, it took about half a day of searching and working out the timetable, um, what services were available, how best to buy the tickets. Um, it's a nightmare because they're not integrated, so you can't buy a ticket from Madrid to London. You have to buy from either each operator individually, which then gives you no journey guarantees, and you're uh, you're left in the 
in the lurch if there's any delays. Um, so I bought through. Actually, I bought my. You have to. I bought a ticket to Barcelona on the Renfe website, and then I bought a ticket from Barcelona to London on the Loco2 website, which is now called Rail Europe. Um, but I know, even though they don't tell you, that it's two separate tickets, which means that I have no journey guarantee at any point. But because TGV is part of Rail Team, there is some journey guarantee. If the TGV is delayed to Paris, I can get on a following Eurostar. But if my Renfe ticket, my Renfe train is delayed, I have no guarantee because they are not part of Rail Team, I don't think. So we'll both be in the same position. We will both be in the same position because I also booked my tickets separately. Um, so I've um, so I'm travelling apart from apart from the whole carbon thing. Um, is um, I brought my husband with me. Right. And he doesn't carry your like bags. to fly to carry my bags. No. <laughs> um, no, we thought we'd make. Um, he'd never been to Madrid, um, and we also spent the weekend in Barcelona. So we thought that we would make a, a little holiday of the trip to Madrid. Um, so we also travelled, we travelled here by train and we're also going back by train, but we did it a lot more leisurely coming here. And it wasn't, it wasn't the most leisurely journey because we got hit by, le- by engineering work, so it all got a bit panicked in the end. But going back, um, we booked our um, tickets from Madrid to Barcelona through train line. We have then um, booked our... Um, Barcelona to Paris with we oui, SNCF, which is a subsidiary of SNCF yeah. <laughs> for ticketing, because that was the cheapest options I found for the two of us. Yeah, and um, I have a confession that we're not paying for our Eurostar because our daughter works for Eurostar. Right, and so um, we get comp- complimentary tickets as part of her. Her working conditions. Well, so, I'm paying for mine. But um, but it was very useful for us that on the way here that we do that we do have a Sarah, um, right. our daughter, because as a result of the engineering work on the way here, we actually had to travel the day before, which meant a rearrangement of our Eurostar ticket. So we were able to say, Sarah, help! <laughs> yeah. And she was able to rebook it all for us quite simply. And I think that that whole guarantee thing is quite interesting because I think had we been shall we say, normal customers, it might have proved very problematic. Yes, and I wrote an article uh, just last month on the way to Vienna when there was a delay on the Eurostar, and I was in... It was not a nice experience um, to try and get on the subsequent high-speed train from Brussels. So there's a whole article about how much of a problem that is, and it is no wonder people are still flying, and it's very sad to say that. Yeah, and I think you know, on that flying, I think it's worth mentioning as well is just that how much more expensive it is to make the right choices because you're not on an equal playing field. Because not only is it a lot more difficult to book, but also it's hugely much more expensive because I think we could have flown here, both of us, to Madrid for eight euros, I think. Yeah. And the even with the the free Eurostar, it has cost us um, I think about two hundred and eighty euros return. Yeah. So it is five times the price. Yes, which is sad. So the powers that be in the rail world or the transport world sort out this rail into into European rail because otherwise that's the only way that you're going to have beat these climate change goals to get people off planes. Yeah. And we will be recording a bit on the train home so you can keep abreast of how easy our journey is. But for now, from Madrid, bye. Bye. So hopefully, by the wonders of podcasting, one, you can hear me, and two, this has worked. So we're currently sat, Johanna and I, in the, uh, the buffet car of the TGV somewhere near Avignon. How's the journey so far? Actually, just to be specific, we're on train number 9702. For those of you that would like to look up what train number 9072 is, because you can Google it and it'll give you the information. And we're running on time or late? Um, We're running a little bit late um, because we had a little bit of a problem between the Spanish and the French border. Um, It's the first time, and I travel a lot by train around Europe, where I've actually had my passport checks at the border. So. Oh, now you're in a different class to me, aren't you? Well, 
Yeah, but they haven't I'm checked in. I'm in castle <laughs> class, and you're wait, and you're in what, what? What class are you in? I'm in the first class. So you're on yeah. So I'm in castle class right. because I'm like down with the proletariat and everything. And they checked your passport. And they checked our passport. So they were obviously looking for some poor person. <laughs> wow. Okay. No, that didn't happen in my class. I mean, you don't get anything in first class except a bigger seat. But now that is interesting. They only check the passport in in um, standard class. Wow. That sounds a bit discriminatory. Well, it also sounds like a very big loophole. <laughs> <laughs> so if you if you want to cross borders. Go in first class, because they obviously don't expect... Top tip. (laughs) (laughs) So, given that the journey is uh, pretty much going smoothly, we're only two off three trains in, um, minus the 20 past five leaving the hotel, bringing it back to our podcast is, how could data have improved your journey? I think actually data could have improved the journey in lots of ways, um, starting right from when we left the hotel, because... We had to do a bit of investigation about how we were going to get to the station. Yeah. Because when I spoke to the reception at the hotel, he was like, oh, you know, it's expensive to order a taxi. Um, You're best just walking to the taxi rank. And, you know, it's one of those, it's a traveller anxiety, isn't it? Because I went to investigate the taxi rank to make sure I knew where it was the night before. Yeah. And all this, because I didn't really trust the receptionist, you know, because... He's Spanish, I'm English. Something might have got a bit lost in translation because my Spanish isn't the best. And, but yeah. his English was pretty good. And so I took a photo, made sure I knew where it was. But then there was kind of, you know, leaving the hotel at quarter past five. Yeah. Would there be a taxi there? Well, there's no know? guarantee. No. And, you know, it would have been nice to have, you know, sort of had some data showing some taxis at the rank because there were some taxis at the rank. That is true. And the other thing was that I, I kind of think I have a, um, a frequent traveller rail user um, brain, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, in my normal life, I probably would have actually have left the hotel about quarter to six. Yes, if you in your home station because you know yeah. how long it takes. Because I know how long it takes that. And the, and the receptionist at the hotel, he kind of panicked me a bit because he was like, oh, Madrid to Totra, it's a big station. You've got to find your platform and all of this. And I was like, oh, my God, no. You had to leave so <laughs> early. Yes, I had to leave so early with you. <laughs> and that's so actually having maybe um, the advanced information of the platform and how long it would take me to get from the taxi rank would have been good. I did check my watch my train and it does not have Spanish trains on it. Oh, Please I fix see. that watch my train. So, 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 so that would have been good information. Sort yeah. Of how long was going. Because actually, when we got there, we actually had quite a long time. We did. Once we'd gone through security. I think probably data about what was going to be at the station would have been good. No coffee because, shops open. Because there were no coffee shops <laughs> open, which, you know. It's what you which, want at quarter to six in the morning. <laughs> which, given I will miss a train in Brighton when I'm going on my normal commute just to get my coffee for the train, yeah. was not a good start. That's, oh, yeah. <laughs> I feel yeah. I feel yeah. I was there. It's quite also interesting now making this podcast uh, whilst watching the vineyards of Beaujolais. Beaujolais, yeah, Beaujolais or Cote de Rhone. It's a wonderful view, isn't it? It is a wonderful view. It is. So, uh, any more data you'd like before we get to Paris? So, have you tried to use the Wi-Fi on the train? I haven't, and the reason I haven't is because I already know it's hopeless. Yeah, I couldn't connect. Having having um, already travelled to Madrid by train, um, to connect to the Wi-Fi, you have to sign up to the website and everything. I have done that with Renfe. I have done it with SNCF. I have done it with We SNCF. <laughs> but there is no available Wi-Fi on this train, so I've just given up. Right. Okay. Well, hopefully our journey goes smoothly and we'll be in London in just a few hours but if not we can do another bonus podcast <laughs> from there <laughs> so bye Johanna I'm going to go to my first class seat see you later bye, bye. <laughs>